Hello students, in this video we'll prove the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem. The Schroeder-Bernstein theorem is a theorem about cardinalities, and it states the following. It says if, if given any sets A and B for which there is an injection F from A into B and an injection G from B into A, then there is a bijection between A and B. And so a consequence of this, of course, is that if there's such a bijection, that means that the cardinality of A is the cardinality of B. So in particular, cardinality of A is cardinality of B. And of course, it's oftentimes much easier to find two injections than it is to find a bijection, so this is a very powerful theorem, okay? And so what's the idea? So how would we prove this? So the proof goes as follows. So proof, if, if G of B is equal to A, we're done. Why so? Because G by assumption is an injection, right? So it's injective and it's bijective if G of B is equal to A. So we have a bijection, done. So assume otherwise, assume that G of B is not equal to A, okay? And then define E zero to be A minus G of B. So that's a subset of A. It's a non-trivial subset of A, okay? So in other words, what we do over here is we sort of think of this configuration. So here's my set A, here's my set B, and then here is G of B, right? That's G of B. And then this E0 is over here. It's everything else in this range over here. So that's my, that blue shade region is gonna be my E0 over there, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to map E0 back into B, so I can look at this thing over here. I can look at F of E0. And then the next, the cool part of this argument is that I'm going to take F of E0 and I'm going to send it back into G. So I'm going to consider G of F of E0. And that thing is, I'm going to call that thing my E1, okay? So E1 is G of F of E0, where E0 is given by this. I'm going to go back and forth, back and forth, and try to capture all of the information that's lost in these injections, okay? If there's any loss at all. Okay, so now, I'm, and then recursively define, define E n plus one to be G of F of E n. So that makes perfect sense, of course, for E zero, for E zero, because E zero, I'm gonna map it over here, then map it back over there, then I have an E one, and where does E one reside? Well, E one resides over here. I can map that into B and then map, map, map into A. So I do this recursively, and E is going to be the union, n goes from 0 to infinity of these sets E n, okay? And now I'm ready to find my bijection, okay? The bijection is defined as follows. Define h of x to be f of x if x is an E, okay? And remember, where does E reside? So E resides as a subset of A, obviously, right? And g inverse of x if x is not an E, okay? So of course, E is a subset of A. So in other words, if, you, if, you, if you're an A, you're either an E or you're not an E, right? So that basically gives you everything in A, right? So we claim H maps A into B as a bijection. Okay. We first have to make sure that it's well-defined. So how do we make sure that it's well-defined? So H is well-defined. So over here, H is well-defined. It's clearly well-defined on E, right? But if X is not an E, if X is not an E, then X is not an E0. Okay? Right? 
because this isn't a compliment, right? Just by DeMorgan's laws. The complement of E is going to be the intersection of all the complements of the E. And so you're not an E0 either, right? So you can't be an E0. But if you're not an E0, that means that X is in A, is not in A minus G of B, right? And that means, of course, that, um, that means what? That means that G inverse of X exists, right? So in other words, X is in the range of G of B, right? So that says that X is in G of B and therefore G inverse of X exists by injectivity. Great, okay, so G inverse of X exists. So in other words, the function is well-defined. That's the first thing we always need to prove is that if I define a function, I have to make sure it makes sense, right? Let's prove the function's injective, right? So why is this function injective? Two, H is injective, okay? Well, it's clearly injective on E, right? And so I have to make sure that I don't have something from E and not an E that go to the same point, right? So how do I do that? So let's suppose that f of x1 was equal to g inverse of x2, where x1 was in E and x2 was not in E. Like that, okay? Well, since g inverse exists, I can apply g to both sides, and that would say that g of f of x1 is equal to what? Is equal to x2, like that, okay? But x1 resides in E, which means that this implies that x has to belong to En for some n, right? So in other words, this x1, this x1 over here resides in En, so if x, x1 is in En over here, then that's gonna force what? That's gonna force x2, by definition, to be in En plus one. And that is a contradiction. So this this statement over here, um, there's no value of x1 and x2 for which this is true, and that proves that H is injective. Okay, excellent. And now finally, what do we need to do? Finally, we need to show that H is surjective, right? H is surjective. Okay. And how do I get that? Well, now suppose it's not, right? Suppose there exists a Y such that a uh, y that was in b, such that what? Such that h of x was not equal to y for any x. Okay, well, that's going to imply two things, right? That implies number one, that says that f of x is not equal to y for every x in e, and two, that g inverse of what? That g inverse of um, x, of y, is not equal to x, right? Because y is in b, and so g inverse, um, let's make sure we're doing this correctly over here. Um, yep, g inverse of x is not equal to y, right? Is that correct? Yes, good. g inverse of x is not equal to y um, for every x not in e. Excellent. And so now what does condition one tell me? So it says that let's let X, if X was in some E N, if X was in E, if X was in E, that says that X is in some E N, right? And that would say what? That would, condition one would say that if X was in E N, then G of Y, if I look at G of Y, G of Y is not equal to what? Then G of Y is not equal to g of f of x, right? And that is what? And then g of y, of course, is not equal to any one of these things. So that says that g of y is not in, g of y is not in e n plus one for n equaling zero, one, et cetera, right? And also g of y can't be an e zero, right? So g of y cannot be an e zero by assumption and so that says that g, can, g of y cannot be an E. And so this over here says that g of y is not an E. So g of y cannot be an element of E by condition one, okay? What does the condition two say? Condition two over here says that x is equal to g of y, x is not equal to g of y for every x not an E, okay? Well, what does that say? So x for every x not an E, g of y cannot be equal to x. So that says that g of y is actually in e. So that is exactly equivalent to saying that g of y is in e, 
okay? So g of y is in e by condition two, and g of y is not in e by condition one, so if this is true, if condition one and condition two are true, then I have a contradiction over here. So that's a contradiction. So my, my assumption that there was no value of x for which h of x was equal to y was faulty, and therefore this h is a surjection. So h is a surjection, it's an injection, and it's well-defined between a and b. So now I have a way of showing that two sets have a, the same cardinality by finding an injection from, one into, from a into b, an injection from b into a, and that's a very powerful tool for constructing, for proving that two sets have the same cardinality. Thank you very much.